I hope you are all enjoying this event so far. We are going to continue now with the fireside chat, and I'm really excited to have all of our speakers with me today. So before we dive in, I would like to introduce our panelists for the fireside chat. So I would like to start with Elena Karen, Director of Special Projects in Search at Google and an author of the book, The Adventures of Women in Tech, How We Got Here and Why We Stay. Then we have Bianca Ximenez, Head of Artificial Intelligence at Dupi, and Michelle Carney, Senior User Experience Researcher at Google and a lecturer at Stanford University on Designing Machine Learning. Thank you all for being here today. I would like to start with a question for the panel and I would love uh, each one of you to give us a short and concise answer just so we can maximize our time. But being machine learning and AI and data science a relatively new field, I would love to learn more about your background and how you, get st you got started in machine learning. So maybe we'll start with you, Michelle, and then we'll move to Bianca and Alana. Awesome. Yeah, so excited to be here. So um, I think my background, I came in at exactly the right time. I've always been interested in how people think about things and in neuroscience. So I actually studied um, cognitive neuroscience. And for those of us who might have heard of neural nets, that actually comes from neuroscience. So I was building out neural networks um, for, let's say, cochlear implant algorithms and that kind of thing too. But just because you can optimize a model to some nth degree doesn't mean that we'll, people will actually perceive a difference about a model performing better than another model. So that's really where I got interested in the people element. So I later got my master's in user experience and machine learning. And uh, as you mentioned, I now work as a UX researcher or researching the experience of machine learning tools. Uh, and I teach on the topic too. That's how much I love it. Fantastic. How about you, Bianca? How did you get started in machine learning? Hi, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, I actually, I'm going to use Michelle's template for, for the, the answer. I come from economics because I've always wanted to understand, like, I, I've always wanted to explain things. And I figured that economics was a good way to do that, to explain um, human built um, institutions and organizations. So um, when I started working though, I realized that what I really wanted to do was deliver value to people. To users and in economics it's really hard to see the user like in the end of the the pipeline and i realized that computing was the best way to do that so i got back um, into school and went in a master's for um, in computer science and later on to a phd in computer science with that which i'm just getting wrapped up now at the end of the year but i decided in my phd to pursue machine learning because i figured I was living in a turning point. We all are in a turning point, a very exciting turning point where we, I can, I could connect like science fiction and all the things I've always liked with um, actual like models and deliverables and how to get things to work at scale and to millions of people. So it was a very exciting time to be a part of that. And I wanted like to leave a mark and to make a difference in that sense. So that's why I started in machine learning. Wow, what a fantastic journey, Bianca. How, how about you, Elena? Can you please tell us more about your background and how did you get started in machine learning? Sure, I think I'm maybe, maybe a bunch of folks listening are kind of like me where my role isn't central to ML. I don't work in ML, but I have to support a team who has to figure out how to use it, how to leverage it. And so I need to know about it because sort of every job is getting to the point where we need to know about it. I really got started in tech. I was a history major in college and I started to self-teach myself HTML and JavaScript um, because I really liked what was then, to date myself, sort of the emerging world of web design and creating on the internet. And so it, that was just really how I started getting into tech and got the interest and later took jobs in tech because I was so inspired. That's fantastic. And actually, coming from a non-traditional tech, tech background myself, um, I'm a pharmaceutical scientist. What you said, Alana, really resonates with me. So I think my next question to you as a follow-up is, um, 
What have you found to be key skills to navigate into different roles in tech and perhaps at Google as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always say that I've, I've worked in a tech company for years and you'd think the problems would be computer problems, but they're all people problems. <laughs> I've, worked, I've worked dealing with people, figuring out people, how to motivate them, how to partner them with them way more than I've sat down and had to worry about a, a true technical problem. And so a lot of what I talk to people about is what I think we misname soft skills, right? We, I think they're actually very hard. They're the things like, how do you no negotiate? How do you influence without authority? How do you lead people and motivate people? How do you deal with people when you're not aligning and it's tough? And how do you deal with conflict? So many things like that. How do you make decisions? And um, those things I think are translatable. They're translatable from role to role. So when I am thinking about what skills I'm building in a role, I don't think necessarily about that specific background that I had to learn for that product. I think about, oh, in this job, I learned how to make decisions. In this job, I learned what you have to do when you have to partner with outside companies. And those are the things that I talk about when I'm looking for jobs, when I'm interviewing, et cetera, because that's what's translatable and that's what helps you move around. I couldn't agree more. And I love the fact that you touched upon uh, leading teams and motivating teams because we are actually also celebrating Bianca who's been recently promoted to head of AI at Scoopy. So congratulations, Bianca. This is very exciting for you and for all of us. And, and I would like to know if, if there was a point in, in your career where you felt like things were really taking off for you. And, and if so, was there anything that you did to signal to your leadership that you were ready for, for the next steps and to take on a leadership role at your company? Um, I'm very excited about this new role too. Um, it would be easier, I think, if I thought there was a turning point. Yeah, I thought it was like, well, this is the point where my career is taken off. I don't think that is real. That is something that we expect to happen, but for me, at least it didn't, but, um, there are very, uh, there are many, um, taking off points in all of our careers. So um, the first one I can remember is, was in 2014, I was still on my master's starting to work with computer science and I went to talk. I joined, a. I started organizing really a Google developer group in Recife, my hometown in Brazil. And I went to an event where I gave a talk to about 60 people. And I thought, wow, that's it. That's like, I don't know, like that's the most exciting thing I've ever done and I'll ever do. And then I started thinking, well, maybe that's not all, you know, and I kept going and I had no idea how far I would get. And as a GDE and as a, I was a product manager in AI and now I'm ahead of AI, but now I impact millions of people indirectly and thousands of people directly. And I, I couldn't think that would happen. So I didn't signal to my leadership. I was ready for something, but I was always willing to do more and, um, also preserving my mental health and my limits, but I wanted to have more responsibility. Sometimes women, they think they're underprepared or that we don't know enough. And, um, I think that when you become an adult, you realize that nobody knows enough. I think that's part of growing mature. So, well, I also don't know enough and that's not different from anyone else. So I'm going to do my best and I'm going to be willing to do it um, as best as I can. And I was lucky that Guppy saw it and that we were working together now too. So I guess that's it. <laughs> Oh, I absolutely love your story and we'll touch upon the MLGD program later on during this conversation. Um, but also, I don't know if you, if you feel the same, but sometimes women and, and people of color, we are often the only in the room, which can spur 
imposter feelings as well. So I think I'll, I'll go I'll go back to you, Michelle. Um, for someone wanting to get started in machine learning, what should they do? How should they get started? Any any tips for for our audience today? Oh my gosh, totally. If I could just let everyone know, like, even though this is like a one way talk, I know that everyone who is watching is an expert in something. And I think that when you realize that you have an expertise in maybe it's something like baseball cards or makeup tutorials or, you know, baking pies, I don't know. I personally, I'm a fiber artist. I do a lot of knitting. That's what my expertise is. Uh, you can realize that machine learning, data science, AI is just a way to problem solve. And you can apply that problem solving skill set to whatever your area or domain of expertise is. Um, the other thing, if you're just getting started, is it can be a little bit intimidating, and that's okay. Uh, but show up, keep on showing up, find communities that resonate with you, friends in other areas. I will say, um, for me, about 10 years ago, I got really lucky and I found women who code, women in machine learning and data science, and they were amazing and supportive to help me actually transition into a career in tech. Um, but there's so many other groups out there. Like I run my own meetup group on machine learning and UX. There's Ladies That UX, which is orthogonal and kind of related to uh, machine learning. Um, and just look around. What communities are near you? Like Bianca mentioned uh, finding that community in Brazil and being all like, wait, these are my people. And these are the people who will hold me accountable and also celebrate the fact that I'm excited and passionate about this topic and will help me achieve my goals. Uh, so definitely check those out. And um, there's free tutorials and everything out there too. Keep on showing up. I love that we all keep uh, referencing community support and building communities. And I all, I believe that community is such an important thing in every field, in every role. So actually, my next question to the panel, and this is a question from the audience, and please keep asking your questions in the chat, uh, either to the panel or to one of our panelists. And um, how do we build communities of allies. As women in tech, how do we create that support system uh, that includes women, men, stakeholders, and to advance our careers and help us show up as our true selves at work? And this is a question for the panel, so who would like to, to start? Well, one thing that I love about community building, oh, sorry, Elena, no. um, uh, is that uh, you know, even if you are making something new, there has always been something that comes before you. And Elena, I'm sure you know about this from history and everything too. So uh, it, looking as, at citing your sources, not as a weakness, but more as a strength of like, I am building off of other people's ideas. And if we can shift that framework uh, and just have that be a normal practice of like, hey, Bianca, Elena had this awesome idea and I'm building on top of it that helps celebrate everyone and all the voices that maybe are heard or maybe weren't heard or weren't ready to be heard. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if we have time. I'm sorry, Elena, go. Oh yeah, I was just gonna add that um, I'm now seeing in groups for, for years at Google, for instance, we had employee resource groups for the group. And those were really important to, I think, give people a place to go of community, of belonging, of common conversation, navigating challenges of programming, maybe even training. So great. But what there weren't necessarily were ally groups for those groups. And I'm seeing now that we're starting to create those. And I think those are a great add-on, right? Like I can join a search black plus group and be an ally and then hear more. But it's there's still the group for black people to get together and not have to worry about talking to us and explaining anything. Um, but there is also this place where we can get together and be allies and figure out how to be allies. So I think that while sometimes we're just trying to do it all informally, I do think there is something to maybe making it formal, making it stated, making it at your company, a thing that you can join, that you can do, that you can sign up for and just inviting people in. Absolutely, Alana. I I couldn't I couldn't agree more with you. And how about you, Bianca? Would you like to add some thoughts on how to build communities of support and allyship as well? 
I think there's a lot to be said on those things, and we we won't be able to extinguish the subject in this panel because it's really short. But um, we're going through that in Guppy right now, so we're building what we're calling affinity groups, which have a lot of allies in in many um, different for many different demographies, and we're making it official or making it institutional. So I think this is very important that we that we organize um, organically, but also that we have support from official institutions. And so I think this is a way to go. This is something important for us to consider uh, as leaders, as companies, as people who work and, and um, need others, which is everybody essentially. So, but like from another point of view, when you're considering um, building a group of allies, I think you have to know yourself a lot. You have to know your limits. Just so you understand, you're able to figure out where you feel comfortable. Um, what do you expect from people who are your allies? And also, like, how to talk with people who, who are not your allies? Like, how can you, can you transform them? Can you bring them to your side? How can you leverage um, their voice and use it to support yours? So there's a lot of things you have to consider. Um, but especially you have to know your limits and be able to connect with people. Sometimes people you don't like and do the hard work of maybe making them change their mind, like building bridges. So this is very important. Definitely building credibility, making sure that our work speaks for itself, but also that we are advocates for the things that we do and that we believe in ourselves. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about allyship and building communities of support during the networking event. So stay tuned uh, for that part of the event. And I would like to move on to the next question from the audience. So one of our participants wrote, it seems like the women that stay in the technical side of engineering are only the ones that are exceptionally smart. As someone that doesn't meet the model minority standard, how should average women engineers like me find a place to keep working on technical projects? And um, Michelle, would you would you like to, to give us an answer to this? And perhaps then uh, we'll move on to Bianca. For sure. Um, yes, in a prior life, I was uh, the only woman over on a totally <laughs> very uh, ML driven team. Um, but some of the things that really resonate with me when I look for a new team are, are there other women in adjacent roles or my manager or my skip level who will understand? Um, the other thing is too, uh, I love that Bianca and Elena have mentioned allies, groups or affinity groups and everything too. I uh, definitely also will like test the waters of like, hey, who is a part of these groups? Can I, do you have any headcount? Can I go join? Um, that kind of thing too. I think it really does reach back to, you know, your job is ideally where you're spending eight hours a day and it has to be on a topic hopefully that you like and you can make an impact but also with people who celebrate you and you feel heard and important and that you can make an impact there too so um look for other people who might have a team of engineers who are women and stuff in fact actually last week was my first meeting where everyone who joined was a female ml engineer and it was totally like happenstance it was like whoa, oh my gosh, in my 10 years, this has never happened. This is so cool. So they're growing. Keep staying here. We need you. Um, I, 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 I don't know the person who, who asked that, so it's difficult to make assumptions. But um, why do you think you're average and everybody who stay there is so, so extra smart? Like, how do you know that, you know? And sometimes you gotta just keep showing up, like Michelle said, um, just so you can see that those people you find are extra smart and maybe like, oh, this is unreachable for me. They're pretty normal people too. So um, I don't know. It's, it sounds to me as if you have a lot of imposter syndrome, but you can be where you are. And we have average people all the way and nobody's that average it's just like michelle said too like everybody's an expert in something so if you connect more with communities around you maybe um and you start start feeling that kind of support and admiration 
people will also tell you you are super smart and maybe you'll be very shocked by it. But hey, probably you are also super smart. <laughs> Everybody is in some sense. So I'd say um, don't don't think of yourself that way and just try to reframe that, you know? I absolutely love it. And that's definitely one of the key messages that we wanted to share with you all today is that don't underestimate your value. We are here, we are showing up as uh, as women in tech, as future leaders in machine learning. And in our own different ways, we all have a place at the table. So my next question is for Alana. And as someone asking, which industry do you think will benefit from ML in the following years? And do you think that women could lead the change in those industries? Oh, that's interesting. I, in general, am keeping my eye on a lot of the, I don't know what I would call them exactly, but the real world applications of things. So if we get outside of what's been sort of hot over the last decade of apps and games and food delivery services to your door and all of this type of stuff, I think what the pandemic brought to life is that a lot of our core infrastructure, societal infrastructure is lacking. And so if you look at healthcare, if you look at services for city workers, if you look at water, air, right? like very basic things, housing, all of these types of applications, I think that there is a real need to focus there and think about how to make it achievable to scale and that logically starts to have you look at ways that ML could support the humans, not put the humans out of work, but ways that we could give better tools, whether it's the x-ray technician, whether it's the city worker trying to identify the next thing that's going to break, what is it? And I think that that is potentially, oh, could be a real forte for women because we have generally, I'm about to go into generalizations, been raised as society's caretakers. This has been true for centuries, right? We, we take care of the families, we take care of the group. Traditional jobs for women initially were things like teachers and nurses, caretaker jobs. And so I think we've still got a lot of that coding. We think about that. You talk to women and they often talk about wanting to help people. And so I think that we are actually more likely to think of these applications potentially more likely to think about how they would apply and help our society. And so I think it's really great that this is all coming together. Um, and I really hope it stays that way. I hope we don't just move on to the next gaming app. I hope we really do take this time and focus in. I think there's a lot of great businesses to come from this and a lot of great career opportunity. I love it. Thank you so much, Alana. We have Another question uh, for Bianca and one for Michelle. So I'll start with Bianca. I am from Colombia. Hello, our Latin uh, participants. Welcome to our event. And I work for a company where almost 70% of employees are women, but in the IT department, they're only men. I am the first woman in the area right now. How can I motivate other women in my company to join me in the field of IT? So Bianca, would you like to perhaps uh, answer this question with a bit of um, a context to what it means for our Latin culture? I, I can try. Um, I don't know if I can answer. It's a very complicated subject, but um, well, I, 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 I know your pain. I'm often um, the, still the only woman in the room. Um, but I think that one of the things we, we must do as women who, who are already here in IT, right, is to let people know that IT is not something like crazy complicated is not something that does not belong to us. Um, there is no space for us. And kind of demystify this idea that 
um, computing and especially maybe machine learning and AI are so unreachable. And just like Michelle said, it's just another way of solving problems. And I think that sometimes women can't identify themselves with um, the area because it looks so masculine, but uh, essentially what we have to understand is, is that it's just another way to solve problems and women excel at that. We're so good at solving problems, right? So why can't we excel in machine learning? It, it, it just makes no sense. So um, if we're coming from that point and like trying to connect how IT works with everything else, um, I think it, it's just, it's a good starting point, like this mystifying AI and ML. Like Com that's what I think. completely agree. I love empowering, uplifting other women in the field. I think that's critically important. And I would like to ask um, another question just very, very quickly to you, Michelle. What is one ML trend that excites you right now? Oh my gosh, totally. Actually, okay, on that topic, Bianca, um, I think just showing people how the technology works is going to be such a game changer. Like in the last five years alone, we have seen so many innovations in how machine learning is done. Like you do not need to train your own models anymore. You can use models off the shelf. Uh, you don't need to be an ML expert to actually work in ML. And so with this like ease of use and the fact that a lot of this is becoming um, a lot more available to every person person, uh, we need more people in the room who actually want to apply it. So like Elena and Bianca were mentioning, um, we need folks who have a passion about medical healthcare and are thinking about what is a potential machine learning problem and how do I apply this model to it? So this is something that definitely keeps me up at night about uh, those domain experts coming in and using other models that other people have built, it, but applied in their new way in their own domain where they are a domain expert. So. I love it. And just very quickly for Alana, you wrote a book called The Adventures of Women in Tech, How We Got Here and Why We Stay. So in speaking with over 80 women that you interviewed for your book, did you notice patterns of what helped women navigate their careers and thrive? Yeah, absolutely. And we've touched on many of them in this conversation. I noticed that there were five key tools. And if you buy the book, it's chapter eight where I cover these. Um, and one of them we've spoken about quite a bit, find support. Because women who'd navigated their careers alone often had a lot of self-doubt and insecurity. But those with support had had those people on tough days, helped the, had people who helped them through decisions or said, hey, you're insecure today. It's not that person shouldn't have said that to you. That's not true, right? All of that. But the other ones were about resilience. How do we build strength and muscle when we have tough days to continue to go on? How do we market ourselves? How do we figure that out? Um, because we are, if we wait to be crowned, it's not always going to happen. We're going to have to get good about talking about ourselves and letting people know what we're strong at and what we want to do. And that really speaks to the next one, which is about asking. Um, how do we ask for what we want and what we need? And the final one is one that I just, I, I always think it sounds a little hokey, but it's true. How do we own our awesome? How do we know, very much like Bianca was talking about earlier, that we're just as smart as everyone else. We deserve it just like everyone else. Um, and how do we remind ourselves out of it, of it and feel it? Absolutely fantastic advice. And as we start wrapping up this session, I just would like to remind our uh, participants that if your uh, question didn't get answered during this event, please go to the TensorFlow forum at discuss.tensorflow.org. Feel free to ask your questions and we will be there answering everything, all the questions that you may have. I'm sorry we are limited on time, but it's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. And having said that, I would like to just quickly post one last question to the panel so we can wrap up with some inspiring and motivational remarks to all the women that are watching us from all around the world. So um, 
if you could give one piece of advice to our audience today, what would it be? And I would like to start with Bianca, then move on to Michelle, and we'll finish with Alana. Um, I think I have two things I want to say. The first thing we've already covered a lot in this panel, which is um, you're not starting from zero. Even if you're like going for another career and you're not originally from computing, no one here is, and we're still doing it. So don't don't get caught up on that. All your soft skills, which are really hard skills to get, they are transferable. So you're not. Um, maybe that's hard to hear also because we always have that idea that we can start from scratch, and that is just not true. Like for the good and for the bad. So you're not starting from zero. So don't be afraid to make the move. And the other thing I want to say is, um, don't don't be don't get caught up on if you look like someone from IT or not. This is something that happened to me a lot when I started like going to communities, um, because people would often say, "Um, you don't look like someone who understands mathematics so much. You don't look like someone from computing. You don't look like whatever." And I'm like, yeah, okay, so if I put my glasses on now, do I look more like computing? Do I look more like mathematics? I don't know, you know? That makes no difference whatsoever, like what you're doing. So don't get caught up on that be you. It's like, I, I think it's credited to Oscar Wilde, but be you because everyone else is already taken, right? So, and IT is just another area of study. Computing is just another area of study and machine learning too. So just come over and look how everyone works. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bianca. Michelle? Yeah, I think if I were to give one piece of advice, maybe just building off of what Bianca just said, um, you don't need to know ML to work in ML. I think that that is something that I really just want everyone who's listening to really resonate with. Um, we've all talked about it, about you have skills, you're an expert in something, You we need folks from different domains to work in ML and build the future of ML that is for everyone, by everyone. So um, I know it can be a little bit intimidating to be like, oh, must have 10 plus years in ML, but you know what, maybe you have 10 plus years as a program manager, or uh, you know, you're know you really great at organizing things and you really wanna keep track of models, that's amazing. We need folks like you here. So uh, know that you are wanted, it is just about finding the right teams for you, but we're excited to work with you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Alana, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think I would just encourage everyone to figure out a safe experiment for themselves, right? I, I think that that may be different size for you than the person that you've seen get into ML before, but I think sometimes we hold ourselves back because we think it has to be this gigantic leap. But maybe <laughs> for you, it's just a safe thing would be saying that next month, every day, you're going to read something about ML to self-educate, right? And so I think those things build on each other. And we should be comfortable starting with these little safe experiments and building from there because that's how we grow. And it don't compare yourself to someone else and think, oh, I need to be that tomorrow. Think about what will work for you and start there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you to our three panelists for joining us today. I think we learned so much from your experiences. It was really exciting to, uh, to have all these questions answered. And if you are watching us live, and if you still have questions that you'd like the team to answer, please head to discuss tensorflow.org and we'll be answering all your questions on the TensorFlow forum after this event. So stay tuned and we'll see you shortly. Mm -hmm.